Like I said, we're in Ephesians chapter 6 this, uh, this morning. We're going to start at verse um, 10 and go through to verse uh, 12. It says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against uh, spiritual wickedness in high places. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that this morning as we look into your word that you would begin uh, right now to speak to our hearts, Lord, about the things that we need to do, Lord, that you would ask us to do. And Lord, we thank you. We ask that you would bless us, your word, that you would give us ears to hear. And Lord God, we not just be hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said this morning, we're in, you know, in, in Ephesians, and the, the letter to the church at Ephesus reveals many thrilling and amazing spiritual facts. The fact you know, is, in, in, in chapter 1, verse 3, it says that he has blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. He has chosen us in him. He has predestinated unto the adoption of, uh, of children in whom we have redemption uh, made known unto uh, the will of his uh, will, sorry, the mystery of his will. We have obtained an inheritance saved by grace through faith, sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise. He also gave us the ministry, and he also made us the body. And so every person in, in the body of Christ has a purpose. Every single person has a purpose in the body of Christ. It's not just one person has everything. You know, and, you know, you get the short end of the stick. Everybody has a purpose in, in, God's, uh, in God's kingdom and in the body of Christ. There's also, uh, there's also in this letter, it contains many sobering teachings. One of the first ones is uh, to walk worthy of the vocation wherein ye were called. That we, have, we, we are to walk worthy of Christ. We are not to go around just kind of doing our own thing, you know, and, and saying, but we are to walk in the Spirit and not according to the flesh, right? We are also, it says, uh, we henceforth be no more children. We're not supposed to be, you know, always on the milk of God's word. We are to be uh, moving on to the, to the meat of God's word. There's a lot of people that have been in church for 40, 50 years, and they're still drinking the milk. And God's word says, no, you're not supposed to be there. You are supposed to be on the meat of God's word. That you are supposed to go on to teach others what God's word says and to go on into the deeper things of God, not just, you know, the spiritual mill. You're not supposed to be spiritual babies for 40 years. I mean, if you saw a guy walking around, I mean, and there are some, you know, weirdos out there walking around and like they're, you know, 50 years old and walking in a diaper and going goo goo gaga, you're going to go, that guy's nuts, Right? Or am I the only one that thinks that's a little crazy for a guy to be going around in a diaper? I mean, that's just me, I guess. But the uh, next one is to put off concerning the former conversation or the former uh, behavior of the old man. We are, not to, uh, we are not to live according to what we used to be, the old man. We are to go on to put on the new man. We are to you know, follow in what he has for us. That we are you know, to not you know, to, you know, constantly uh, be looking back and go, man, that was so much better there. It's kind of like it reminds me of the uh, Israelites when they were going you know, out of the Exodus. They kept on saying, you know what, it was so much better back in Egypt. It was so much better back in slavery and bondage. That's what they were essentially saying. God's word says, don't do that. You know, put off the old man and put on the new man. It also says, wherefore, put away lying. We're not supposed to be lying to one another. How many of you like it when somebody lies to you? No, I don't, I don't like it. And here's the other thing I, you know, I've said before and I've heard before is the fact that when you tell a lie, you have to remember that lie and then continue to build off of that lie so that way you don't get caught in the lie. But if you tell the truth right away, you don't have to worry about that because you're not going to sit there and forget, oh, wait, I forgot you know, this, this, and this. No, you're going to know that God's word says that, and that you're going to go ahead and do that. Also, it says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Anything that is not edifying or building up of the body of Christ is not supposed to come out of our mouth. If we are going around and we are just constantly tearing each other down, you know, because I think some people think that their spiritual gift is to tear down so they can build somebody back up again. The body, of Christ, uh, you know, the Bible never says that we are, you know, we are to tear somebody down in order to get them built back up again. We are to, to continually build. We 
if something in our life is not right, we should tear down that stronghold in our life. We should tear down those things that are not right. But it is not our job to go about going to somebody else and telling them, you know what, you're horrible. And it's constantly, you know, go and get them, you know, feeling like they're, you know, the smallest slug in the world. So that way we can build them back up again. We are to edify one another with our mouths in the way that we are. And it says, uh, number six on this one, grieve not the Holy Spirit. We are not to grieve the Holy Spirit by the way we live. We are to glorify God and to bring glory and honor and praise to the Holy Spirit as we uh, go through God's word. And so how can we do all these things that he commands and abstain from all the things that he forbids? God knows, our, uh, goes, he knows us in our situation. God knows us, and he knows our situation, and God always provides a way. God always provides a way. This morning, I want to talk to you. The title of my sermon is, How to Do What God Wants You to Do. How to Do What God Wants You to Do. And it's in those three verses that we just read in Ephesians chapter 6. Number one is that God himself will strengthen us. God himself will strengthen us in verse 10. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. That word finally just means the rest of it, the remaining. Finally, all the stuff that I told you, finally, my brother, he says, finally, this is what you're supposed to do. He's saying, now this is how you do it. I've told you all of these things that you're supposed to uh, you know, those sobering teachings that I already you know, told you all these things, but now I'm going to tell you how to do it. Then he says, to be strong, or be strong in the Lord. That is to acquire strength. It is a command, uh, it is a command to do for yourself and not to just do it by yourself. Because why? Because you have the Lord. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, he is going to help you in this. He's saying, be strong in the Lord. Well, who else is stronger than the Lord? No one. And he can help you, right? If we truly believe God's word, he will help you. He says, be strong in who? The Lord. Not be strong in yourself, because you're weak. He says, be strong in the Lord, because you know what? His strength is infinite. It's powerful. It says, and in, and in the power of his might. That word, you know, power just simply means, you know, strength, bodily, you know, it's a bodily strength, superiority, force, uh, strength as exerted, and in, uh, might is uh, physical strength. But here's the funny thing: it says, "And in the power of whose might? His might, not yours." So, if we are to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, what can stop us? Nothing. If we are depending upon Him, He is the source of the power, you know, that is available to us. There's nothing that we can't do because God is there with us as long as we walk according to the Spirit and not according to ourselves, according to the flesh. And the source, there is a source of power that is available to us not to do what we want, but what He wants. God wants us to do what He wants. Why? Because if we do it, we mess it up. Right? I mean, how many times has... I sat there, and, you know, a lot of times just, you know, for, for instance, like with my dad. My dad would, you know, show me something, and I said, I, I got it. I know what I'm doing. You know, I'm done with you. You know, I'm done. You know, you know I, I, I listened to this once. I, I got it. And then all of a sudden, about like 10 minutes later, like, what was that again? How do I do that again? So when we trust, you know, when we trust God to, to do it, he is going to do um, what he wants, because his ways are perfect, our ways are not. And it's not to glorify us, but it's to glorify him. When we, uh, you know, rest in that power, you know, in the power of his might, and we walk according to the spirit and not according to the flesh, what ends up happening is that we're going to glorify him and not ourselves. Because we're going to do it his way, and that's the way to do it. Number two, we must use every precaution. Every precaution. Why is the Apostle Paul at this point talking about, like, warfare? He's talking about warfare. I mean, think about it. He shifts everything all of a sudden at the end, and he says what? In verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. That's military. That's, that's you know, God wants us to all of a sudden he realize that we're in a battle, we're in a fight. And who's the one supplying the armor? 
God. The Lord is supplying the armor of God to us. He says, put on the whole armor of God. To put on is to clothe oneself. You're putting that on. It doesn't do you any good if your armor is sitting off to the side in a closet. You have to, if you're going to battle and to war, you need to go in the closet and get it out and put it on. It's not going to do you any good to just sit there and go, well, you know, I've heard about that. Or I, I've heard that the armor was pretty strong. The only way you're going to find out is if you put it on. The whole armor, that, that is full armor, is complete. This included uh, such as a, the sh- uh, sword, uh, shield, helmet, breastplate, the The armor of a soldier was often a display of splendor so that the enemy knew who you stood with and would come after you. If you're wearing a certain thing, I mean, it's like just the same thing in the military. When they go over, you know, in war, they wear a a certain uniform so they don't shoot the wrong person, right? Who you are in Christ is, we are to display his splendor. When we put on the whole armor of God, all of a sudden the enemy knows, hey, you know, Doc is one of, you know, is one of mine. Or sorry, is one of God's. That's what the enemy knows. The enemy all of a sudden knows that Doc is not, you know, on the enemy's side anymore, right? Next week we're going to get into the whole breastplate and sword and all that kind of stuff and what that means. But the thing is, is that he knows at that moment who you, where you stand, and who you're with. So why do we need to put on his armor? Why do we need to put it on? Why do we sit there and go, you know, I, I need to, you know, why do I need to read my Bible? Why do I need to pray? Why do I need to do this? Why do I actually need to put off the former self, the old man? Why do I need to do all this? He says here, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's why you need to do it. It's not something that you should. I've seen people go, I'm going to put it on right now. I'm going to put on the helmet of salvation. I'm going to get my sword and whatever. And they never do anything with the armor. There's a practical application. Like I said, next week we'll talk about. But there's a practical a- application. It's not just for you to go, I'm going to put it on now. No. Read God's word. Pray. Seek his face. It's not the fact that we all of a sudden sit there and go, oh, I'm going to symbolically put it. No. Read his word. We need to read his word and follow what he says. It says that, that uh, we may be able, in other words, so that you are able to do what? Stand against the wiles of the enemy. The devil has been doing what he does for a long time. He knows where you're weak at. He knows those areas in your life that he can get you. He doesn't you know, tempt you in the same way. I mean, it's like he doesn't tempt Anthony in the same way that he tempts Brother Doug. Because he knows Anthony, and he knows Doug, and he goes, well, that's not going to work on Doug. It'll work on Anthony, but it's not going to work on Doug. Or it's not going to work on, on Antonio, but it'll work on Anthony. He knows the areas in which you are weak. Not everybody uh, struggles in the same way. There are some times where we have similarities in, you know, in the things that we struggle with. It may not be one area of life, but it may be another area of life. That's why it's important for us to come to a church and have that fellowship so that way we know what God's Word says and we know that others are there that can actually help us through those situations. That's why we come to church. People are like, I don't need church. I got enough church, I can stay at home and whatever. You know what? You want to you wanna fight that battle on your own? So be it. You're going to be a lone wolf out there, you know, and the enemies is going to sit there and take you out every single time he gets a chance. That's why we needed a fellowship, everybody coming together, so that way we can build each other up in the most holy faith, right? It says that we are saying, this is in a military sense, the word indicates either to take over, to hold a, a, a watch post, or... It could also mean to stand and hold out in a critical position on the battlefield. We are to stand against those things. We are to stand against the wiles of the enemy. How do we do that? In Christ. That's the way that we do it, is the fact that we are to stand against against the enemy. But it's only in Christ Jesus that we are able to do that. 
And when we realize that when we stand up, because the thing is, is what's the old, you know, what's the old saying that if we don't stand for something, we'll fall for anything? If we don't stand for something, if we don't stand for, for Christ, then we're going to fall for everything. Or the fact is, what's going to happen is that we're going to get taken out every single moment. We're going to keep on failing, keep on failing, keep on failing. So what are the wiles? I mean, that's a word that we don't necessarily use nowadays, the wiles of the devil. That simply means scheming, craftiness, and methods. That's what the devil does. The devil sits there, and he has his methods, he has his craftiness, and he's, he's scheming up a plan on you. How many of you like a person that's very, you know, you know, that seems that they're schemy? Or they like to scheme somebody? Or they have a scheme against you? No, nobody likes that at all. But that's what the devil does all the time. And a lot of times he's, you know, he can be uh, very, very effective in this. Why? Because if we don't realize he's going to try and attack us in those areas, he's going to keep on doing it until, you know what, you've put it into subjection under Christ. If your problem is pornography, he's going to keep on, you know, giving you all these different reasons why porn is a, is a good thing to, you know, to look at. If your problem, you know, is a fact of like, you know, cussing and swearing and everything else, he's going to keep on putting situations and circumstances until the Lord helps you. I'm not saying that you're all of a sudden you're going to be perfect in it because there's times where you're, where that's going to, you know, something's going to maybe slip or whatever. I'm saying he's going to keep on trying to attack you until that's not an area of weakness anymore. He's going to keep doing it until you decide, you know what, until you say, Lord, I can't do it on my own. I need you. And you put on the whole armor of God. Amen? So what would we consider uh, Satan's methods to be? Number three, the nature of the Christian or the church's enemy, which is the devil. We see this in verses 11 and 12. The devil is known as the slanderer. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's the father of lies the tempter. I mean, he even went as far as to tempt Jesus Christ. Oftentimes people say, well, you know what, God, you know, uh, the devil's not going to do anything because you know, I have Jesus. If the devil tempted Jesus, he's going to tempt you. You are no better, you know, if you think that you're better than Jesus and you're not going to get tempted, I hate to break it to you. You're wrong. If he tempted the devil, or sorry, if, if the devil tempted Jesus, he is going to tempt you. And you say, well, you know, I know God's word. How did the devil tempt Jesus? With God's word. With his word. Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 through 10 says, it, and, and I'll read it out to you. You can you know, hear it right now. It says, and when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. But he, Jesus, said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So you see this here, that he's not saying that, you know, that we shouldn't eat food. He's saying, you know, he's put on the same level of saying, you know what, you need to eat. But you know what, what's more important to you is God's word. That you know what God's word says, so that way when the enemy tries to tempt you, you know what God's word says. It's not the fact of, like, I can go, I'll just go out there willy-nilly and thinking, well, I think I, I read the Bible enough, I got it taken care of. No, that's why you need to read the Bible every day. Every day. You say, well, that seems like an awful lot. Well, listen to it. Get God's word in you so that way you know when the devil comes, you go, going, nope, that's not God. That's the devil. He's going to try, try and make himself sound like God to you. But if you know God's word, you're going to be able to, to defeat the enemy. Let's go on and read. It says, then the, uh, then the devil uh, took him up into the holy city and sat him on a pinnacle of, yeah, on a pinnacle of the temple. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. So when he says it is written, what is he doing? He's quoting God's word. And we think that the devil doesn't know God's word. He's quoting it to Jesus, who spoke it into existence. And he, said unto, and he said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in, uh, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time 
Thou dashed thy feet against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So Jesus, the devil's like, Hey, you know what? Try and twist God's word. Jesus comes back and says, No, this is what God's word says. This is what God's word says. And it says again, The devil took him, took him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, uh, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. If the devil is, uh, tempts Jesus with his own words, what makes you think that you're not going to have that same thing happen to you? That's why we need to know what God's word is backwards and forwards. I mean, we need to memorize it as much as we possibly can. Well, you, you say, well, you know what? I have my TV shows I need to watch. Sometimes we need to turn the TV off and say, you know what? I need to hear what God's word says. Because for one thing, if you want to hear lies all the time, turn on the TV. If you want to hear partial truths, turn on the TV. If you want to hear 100% truth that it has no political bias or anything else, read God's word. God's word is going to set you up for success in this life. He's going to say, you know what? If you follow my word, what does he say? You're blessed. But it's when we do our things on our own and we say, you know what? I think I got this on my own. Bad things happen. And he says well, oftentimes that that's going to lead to like, you know, cursing in your life because of the fact that you did things outside of his plan. I mean, and th- uh, to think of this whole situation with the devil and Jesus going back and forth, this only proves Satan's arrogance, doesn't it? That he thinks that he can actually, you know, twist up or, you know, uh, cause Jesus to trip upon what, he, what Jesus said. I mean, how arrogant is Satan? And that arrogance is going to go on to you. I mean, he's compared to a fowler, a wolf, a roaring lion, and a serpent. And like I said earlier, he's a slanderer, accuser of the brethren, father of lies, and a tempter. Those are all things. There's many other names that he has, and they're not good. Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, the, uh, against principalities, against uh, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So what does this mean? That when we wrestle, it's, it's, it's a struggle. It's hand-to-hand combat. That we fight against those things in this life. It says, for we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. Wrestling is, you know, or was characterized by trickery, cunning, and strategy. I mean, think about it. It's the same, you know, as it is nowadays. You're trying to get your opponent to think you're going to do something that you're not going to, so that way you can trick them the other way. It's all about strategy and about the way that you're going to try and pin your opponent and try to get them and try to uh, you know, get your opponent to tap out or to, you know, or to pin them, right? That's what the, the devil wants you to do. The devil wants you to, uh, to, to get pinned, to, be, uh, to get tapped out. He wants that. It's all a part of his strategy. Flesh and blood is the reference to humanity as mankind. We don't fight against flesh and blood. That's what the Bible says, right? So when you have so-and-so cut you off in traffic, or you have so-and-so come up to you and yell at you, you're not fighting against flesh and blood. The devil is at work in that person. You say, well, this person's saved. That doesn't mean, just because a person is saved, does not mean that they can't, you know, they can't say the things that Satan wants you to say. A believer cannot be possessed by the devil. Just so you know, they can be oppressed or they can get on the lines of that they, you know, they just start listening to what the enemy tells them. If you say, well, that's impossible. I, I, I wouldn't even say that they could be oppressed. Well, you can look at Jonah. God told him to do something, and what does he do? He listens to the enemy. In this case, it was himself. He says, I don't want to go there. I don't want those people to get saved. We have, that's the struggle that we, and the thing is, is that it's not, as much as we want to yell at the person that cut us off in traffic or did this or whatever, we're not fighting against them. The Bible says that there's a spirit, uh, you know, there's a spiritual, you know, things that happen behind the scenes that we don't see. 
Principalities are the highest dignitaries of the state, uh, the first place. And some of the stuff, you know, you know, that you find out and you begin to read about these principalities, I mean, a lot of times the word principality actually refers to princes, those that who are in charge over you. Nowadays, well, who, would that, who would that be? Mayors, governors, senators, presidents, right? You say, wait a second. No, but the Bible says right here that they're the ones that are basically are calling the shots on, on things that go on in your life. These princes or principalities are those that are in, you know, over you. Sometimes you have a good prince. You know, but a lot of times you're not going to have that good prince that's going to take care of you. And some people say, well, you know what, the government, I made this comment the other day, and maybe one day I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more. If we think that the government is always for us, wake up. Because the government's going to do what is in the best interest of the government. The government, you know, could care less about, uh, you know, could care about a lot of people as long as they're able to get what they want. And I'm not saying every single, like, governor, every single senator, every single, is a horrible person and that we should go over there and just yell at them and tell them that, you know, they're the worst person ever. Because there are godly, you know, people in charge of us, right? But there are ones that are seeking out their own agenda. They have their own plan for those things. Next one is powers, it's the, den- the denying the presence of any hindrance, liberty, or authority to do anything. Rulers of the darkness of this world. That's the Lord of this world, the world uh, holders of darkness. Who is the ruler of this world? Satan, right? Spiritual wickedness in high places, right? It says the, those are spiritual hosts of evil in the heavenlies. There are spiritual wickedness. There are things going against you that you will never see, but they are there. I'm not saying that you should go around every single corner and be like, oh, the devil made me uh, you know, stub my toe. The devil's not around every single corner trying to get you to do something. But there is a, you know, the devil is trying to get you to do what? Deny who Christ is. He could care less whether or not you stub your toe in the middle of the night. The smart thing we would do is to turn the light on so that way you don't stub your toe in the middle of the night. But the enemy wants you to do what? He wants you to deny Christ. He wants your life because he wants people to look at you and say, well, so-and-so is a believer in Jesus. They're a Christian. But yet, what are they doing? How are they showing their life? They're hypocritical, right? That's one of the biggest things you'll ever hear from somebody. I can't go to church because all the people there are hypocrites. And oftentimes, the biggest hypocrite is the person saying it. You say, well, how dare you say that? No, we need to look at that because often the things that we ourselves have a problem with somebody else doing is a problem that we have and we just want to project it onto somebody else. We don't want to like take care of it ourselves. What we want to do is actually have that problem you know, uh, on somebody else and say, you know what, they're so horrible, you know, you should see what they do. It's often you know, the thing that we ourselves are dealing with. And what we need to do is take care of ourselves and not so much worry about the other people. Now, if we've you know, taken that to the Lord and we say, you know what, and we don't struggle with that you know, anymore, and we see somebody else struggling in that area, we can come along gently and say, you know what, I used to you know, have a problem with this. Let me show you how the Lord helped me to defeat that, to overcome that, right? For, you know, for our contest is not with human foes. But this is what we need to realize. We don't have a human foe. The Bible says that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, it was, but against master spirits of, the wor- of this world and spiritual agents from the very headquarters of evil. What we need to realize is that, yes, there are uh, you know, demons out there. There are you know, the devil out there trying to get you to do what? Be a bad example to those around you. To not follow what Jesus Christ says. Are we going to be perfect? No. But we should, in, we should always be striving to do what God has us to do. For a lot of us, sometimes it's the fact of our, 
like what he was talking about before is the fact of having no corrupt communication come out of our mouths. We need to get our mouths under control, right? That's why James, you know, said that it is a restless evil that cannot, that cannot um, be uh, controlled. Well, you know what? When we hopefully begin to uh, put that in subjection to Christ with our mouths, instead of us saying something that we can't take back, we just keep our mouths shut. Even if we would really, really want to say it, and we really think it's a good zinger to come back on somebody with. You guys know what a zinger is? It's not the chocolate from Hostess. You know what it is. It's, the, it's those ones where somebody says something to you, and you're like, ooh, I got a good one to get right back at them. I can make, the, I can make my point. Instead of saying that, you know, just say, you know what, I'm sorry. Because that's, you know, that little zinger that we get back at them, you know, so we can get back and even the score is not going to do anything. It's only going to make the situation worse, right? And so that's what, you know, that's what we need to realize, that, you know, with our mouths or anything else that, you know, that's in this life is those things that we struggle with. It's not that we're never going to get the upper hand on the devil when we are in the flesh. When we walk according to the Spirit, God is going to do what? He is going to help us to overcome those things. So you say, you know what? So, you, Pastor, you said, how do, uh, how, do, how to do what God wants us to do. That's the title of your message. So far, I just hear you, you know, talking about going through all these things. So how do I do those things that God wants me to do? So what shall we do? We face many assaults from Satan daily. There are many times. Satan will use people to get us mad, get us frustrated. That's why I, you know, the Bible you know, talks about reading, you know, starting our day off with God's Word, right? Because if we start off with God's Word, oftentimes what happens? It puts us in the right perspective. It helps us to realize, hey, you know, and what I realize also that when I open up God's Word, that the stuff that I go through that day is oftentimes what God's Word said. Or there's been times where I've read God's Word, and a couple days down the road, I'm dealing with something, and all of a sudden, I remember a couple days ago, God, you know, God, that's what God's Word told me, that, that this is how I should handle it. When I decide to prolong it or, or put it off and say, you know what, I got all these other things to do, the devil's like, he ain't putting on his armor. Now's the time to attack. I mean, what better way to go about getting somebody is when they're not wearing any armor? The enemy's coming at you with, you know, swords and cannons and everything else and all sorts of arrows and everything else. And they're like, he, didn't even have, he, doesn't even have, he doesn't even have a feather duster to take care of himself. How does, he, how does Satan assault every Christian every single day? Temptation to neglect. Temptation to neglect God's word, the time in prayer. Neglect those times, you know, with other believers that we can grow in the Lord. Temptation to quit, to say, you know what, I don't know, think I can do this anymore. I don't know if I can handle this anymore. Temptation to be a skeptic. All of a sudden you go, did God's word really say that? Did he really? I mean, think about it. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It says, hath God said? That's what the serpent said to Adam and Eve. Hath God said? Did God really say, and all of a sudden you become skeptical, right? Satan assaults the church. How? The temptation to change. We have to be like the latest and greatest out there. The temptation to change because, you know, hey, we're not reaching people, you know, with lasers and lights and, and smoke machines, so we got to do something else. The church was never meant to be a rock concert. The church was never meant to look like what the world wanted. The church was supposed to be different always than what the world wants. Just because, you, go, you know, there's churches out there going, oh, that was, amazing, that was amazing worship. No, you had a great time at a rock concert. That's what you had. There's always that temptation to change because I've heard people say, well, you know what, it, it just seems to work. But did God say that it was something that should be changed? Did God really say, you know, you know to change this, 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 and this, to make it look like it's a nightclub? 
There's a temptation to compromise and say, well, you know what? And this is something that I'm seeing more and more in church in, in general. Does the Bible really say that there's a problem with drinking? I mean, and they never really go as far as like one verse that they take out of context. I mean, there's times where I've sat there and I talked to somebody and they say, well, the, the Bible said, you know, the, you know, and this is a whole other sermon for a different time, so I, I got, you know what, I'm not going to go into it. But I've heard so many excuses for why, you know, as far as drinking or any other kind of compromise that's out there. You know, well, it's okay to do this, this, and this because God's Word doesn't really say it. There's a temptation to back away from the problem areas. If I don't have to deal with it, I just get away from it. And eventually that problem is going to go away, right? If I don't deal with it, eventually the, you know, the people will get along, right? Sometimes the pastor and the deacons and all that have to do what? Have to approach those problem areas. And people don't like that because you know what? Some of those problem areas are the areas that we, we, we covet, we, we hold close to us, and we want that. We don't want somebody else messing with that area in our life. Even though that we know it's a sin and that God, you know, is not happy with it. And that we're not growing in our relationship because that area is holding us back. We know that it's holding us back, but how dare somebody, you know, go after that area that we really, really love and want to hold on to. Right? And there's a temp- and the, the, this one goes on as well. As far as Satan assaults the church, how? The temptation to quit. We can't really make it this way. If we don't do this, if we don't do that... We just can't do it. We might as well just sh- uh, you know, shut the doors. There's always that temptation. It's a sad day to me when a church closes its doors for the final time. You say, well, why is that? Because there's no godly influence in that community anymore. It's a sad day when a church has to close its doors. You know, it's even sadder days when you have a church that comes along and, uh, and likes to steal uh, members. I could tell you of one in particular, but I won't. And it's, it's known. It's known they will go around and they basically come around and then they will come to district council, uh, council which is the Assemblies of God. And they will come out and be like, well, how many new members, you know, how many people are getting saved and everything else? And they'll come, oh, we had three, four hundred. No, they had three or four hundred that they stole from other churches. Transfer growth is not growth. Our purpose, there's enough unsaved people in the world for us to go after them and not have to try and steal people from other churches. But yet this church is you know, being you know, highlighted and known as going this big wonderful thing of, oh my goodness, they're reaching, no, they're not reaching anybody. They're not. They're reaching the saved that they stole from another church. I think the medicine is working. I'm starting to feel better. We need to be strong in the Lord, right? The Bible says we need to be strong in the Lord and what? And in the power of His might. We need to be strong in conviction. What the Bible says, we don't move you know, from that. Just because the world wants us to take a different position on this, this, and this does not mean all of a sudden that we're going to go, oh, well, the world doesn't like it, so we better go ahead and do what they want us to do. No, if the Bible says it, I'm following that and not what the world says. I don't care what the world says. The world does not care what God's word says. We have people out there who say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian and everything else. And they could care less. They never brought the Bible up, ever. The only time they ever bring it up is going, hey, if I can find a verse that I can twist so I can use it against somebody else. We need to be strong in commitment. And I know that oftentimes people say, well, you know what? Going to church all the time, oh, man, it's, it's a bit, that's a big commitment. But here's the, the other side of the equation. How many times does, uh, does it take someone to sit there and go, you know what, they make a big commitment to sports for their kids? Or you have ones at home right now, they're getting like, NFL is getting ready to start here in 50, uh, 53 minutes. I better go ahead and watch me, you know, some football. Sunday is the only time I get to, you know, I get to sleep in. I've heard that excuse. I mean, I've heard all kinds of things, and the thing is, yes, it does take a commitment. 
And I know that there are times where people in the past have, have taken uh, people for granted because like, they're like, hey, they're the only ones volunteering. But if everybody in the church would you know, be strong in you know, commitment to reaching, the, uh, you know, reaching people outside the church and for the church, the workload would not be as, uh, as big as it is. What does the Bible say? I mean, the labor, you know, the harvest is what? Plentiful. But the laborers are few. We need to be strong in prayer, right? Every Wednesday night we have, we have a prayer meeting. And honestly, the awesome thing and the powerful thing is, is that it's been growing. There's been a lot more people that have been coming... You know what? I sit there and I go, you know what? Because you know, some people say, well, Pastor, how come it wasn't growing when you were leading it? And I say, I don't know, but I don't really care. I'm just glad that it's growing. And I praise God for, you know, that, you know, Doug, our brother Doug does it and that it is growing. I'm, I'm thankful for that. There's no, there's no animosity to be like, how dare Brother Doug grow, you know, church. I love it. I come in here and go, man, this is awesome. This is awesome. But we need to be strong in prayer. We need to pray together as a body of believers so that way we can you know, grow stronger together because when we are together, the Lord is with us. Amen? We need to be prepared. Take everything that God has to offer. If God's word says that this is a promise for the believer, take him at his offer. Whether that be wisdom and understanding, because that's what the Bible says. It says, with all thy getting, get wisdom and understanding. He's saying, you know what? Get wisdom and understanding. Who else would you rather get wisdom and understanding from than besides the Lord? He knows the beginning from the end. He knows all things, right? So why not take him, on, take him up on that offer? Next, put off everything he tells you to put off. If he tells you not to do something, Stay away from it. Put off the old man. If there's somebody you know, telling you to go do something that you know is against God's word, stay away from it. Don't sit there and go, well, you know, I think I'm strong enough. I've heard people say that. Like, I've heard people say that when they struggle with alcohol, and they used to be an alcoholic, and they're like, I think I'm now strong enough to handle witnessing at a bar. You are putting yourself right in the middle of a fight that you may win and you may, you may lose. But why do that? Don't do that. Finally, put on everything he tells us to put on. Like he says, to put on the new man, to put on the armor of God, to put on those things. How do we do that? Well, next week, we're going to see you know, how um, they talk so, you know, about the sword of the Spirit. What's the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. Out of all of the uh, all of the things mentioned in the armor, the word of God is what the only offensive weapon. Everything else is defense. Well, you got the helmet of salvation, right? The breastplate, breastplate of righteousness, right? Our feet, you know, shod with the gospel of peace. We have all these things. But the Word of God is the only offensive weapon. That's the only way we are going to be able to defeat the enemy is by knowing God's Word. If we don't know God's Word, the enemy sees a crack in the armor and he knows where to attack. Right? I mean, if I'm going against somebody and it's a matter of life and death, which this is, I am looking for the weakness I am not um, you know, looking for an area of strength in that person's life. I am looking for their weakness. If I see you know, a crack in the armor, I'm going for that. I'm not going for the area that's reinforced and has all this protection and everything else. I'm going for the weakness. This morning I wasn't having an altar call, but since my wife and I are not necessarily feeling well, I'm still going to have it, but just not, you know, not the way, you know, as far as people coming up, because we don't want to spread anything that, as well with this. So what I want to do is I want to pray for those that they would be strengthened in the Lord and in the power of his might. I want to, I want to pray for, you know, for 
you here and those that are watching online, that they would be strengthened in the Lord and in the power of His might. Because that's the only way, when we trust in Christ, that's the only way that we are going to be able to make it. Remember, if we're strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, who's stronger than the Lord? No one. I mean, I believe that in, in Romans, you know, chapter 8, it says, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he goes through a long list of them and basically says nothing is going to be able to separate us from his love, right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, I, I, I pray right now for each and every single person uh, that can hear this. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them. Lord, that they would be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That when the enemy wants to come in and lie to them and tell them all kinds of of falsehoods, that they would uh, be able to come back and say, you know what, this is what God's word says. That just as the enemy tried to uh, tempt you and try to get you to uh, uh, deny yourself and to do the things that, you know, your word didn't say, Lord, I pray that we would trust in you, that we would walk in the spirit and not according to the flesh, Lord. God, that as your word has said of what to do, that we should put on the new man, that we should put on the armor of God, that we should put on these things, that we should take the, uh, the offer that you have given to us. You said, you know what, I'm going to provide this for you. We should take you up on that. And so, Lord, I pray right now that you would strengthen. And anyone right now that maybe is in the midst of a battle, that maybe they feel like they cannot win or that they, that they just feel like, you know what, there's no way that I'm coming out of this. Lord, I pray that you would uh, encourage them and that us as believers would encourage, uh, encourage them in the way that they should go. And Lord, that we know that, that nothing is going to be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Lord, I thank you. And Lord, I ask as, as you have brought everyone, everyone here safely, I ask that you would take them home safely or wherever they may go. Lord, I pray that as throughout this week that they would have an opportunity to share the gospel with someone. Lord, knowing that that might be the last time that they uh, are able to see them. But Lord, I pray that we take advantage of that opportunity that you would open up doors for them to preach your word to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, This Wednesday, we will have uh, service. Um, This Wednesday, our prayer service, uh, youth and, yeah, youth and uh, kids are together, uh, you know, this week. Make sure you pick up a bulletin so that way you're able to keep up on everything we got going on. And like I said, God bless you. You are dismissed.